Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a podcast and webcast series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives take a nonpartisan, objective look at a range of timely topics that matter most to business leaders. I'm your host, Steve Odland, and I'm the CEO of the Conference Board and the host of this webcast and podcast series. And in today's webcast, we're going to focus on an issue that has been front of mind for a lot of investors, and that is ESG funds. What are they? What's their track record? What are they trying to accomplish? Uh, but also, why are they now so controversial? Joining me today is Paul Washington. Paul is a leading voice in sustainability, corporate citizenship, and governance, ESG. He's the director of the ESG Center here at the Conference Board. Paul, welcome. Delighted to be with you, Steve. So, Paul, what are these ESG funds, what do they invest in? What does ESG mean as it relates to these things? Sure. So ESG funds come in a variety of, of types. Um, there are ones that uh, have negative screens, so where uh, in the funds will not invest in certain companies or certain industries that investors find so objectionable. They screen they out. Screen out okay. right? Exactly. So we won't invest in tobacco. We won't invest in whatever, right? Um, then there are funds with positive screens, which is we will only invest in uh, companies and industries that we think are going to have a positive impact on society or the environment, you know, wind energy or something like that. The bulk of ESG funds are ones that take environmental, social, and governance factors into consideration to one extent or another, and that's a controversial issue, um, in, in making decisions. And those come in two types. There are the actively managed funds, and then there are passive funds, often uh, ETF index funds. So where you take the S&P 500 and you knock out certain companies that you don't think qualify as, as uh, meeting your ESG criteria. All in, those actively managed ESG funds and the passive funds are about $2.7 trillion today, which has uh, grown uh, you know, by 53% in just the last year. In just the last year, yeah. wow. Yeah. And, and so the ones that have the, the uh, active screens, mm -hmm. uh, they're called- Impact I funds. Impact funds. Yeah. And so that takes you to a certain sector or a certain Right. Kind of business. Right. Yeah, right? it does. And one of the things that's interesting about that, so I was talking to the head of impact investing at, at T Row on a, on a prior podcast. And, um, you know, they will look at companies that are actually going to have a positive impact on the environment or on, they were really focusing on public health. And a cool thing is that people often think that Europe is ahead in when it comes to sustainability investing. He said that they are not overweighted to Europe, they're actually weighted toward the U.S. because they think the U.S. actually has at a competitive advantage in, um, in having companies that are going to make a positive difference on environmental and social factors. Wow, okay. And these, these kind of funds, though, you, I, I, you know, you said before that they're, they've been around a long time. They have. Yeah, the screens, um, the, 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 the funds that have the negative screens, the so they used to be called socially responsible funds where we want to invest in whatever sin industry or something like that. They've been around since the 1960s. Wow. But the broader ESG funds have really grown, you know, exponentially in the last decade. Okay, so these are... Um, these are the equity funds. Mm -hmm. There's also debt. There's debt, right. And so um, debt has grown even faster. So it started off with things called green bonds, where um, you would issue debt for a particular project, you know, solar energy or something like that. And now it's expanded to what's called sustainability-linked bonds, where the interest rate that's paid is tied to the ability of the company to achieve certain environmental and social goals. And if they achieve the goals, then the interest rate is actually lower. That's grown phenomenally quickly. Back in 2013, there was just $30 million, $30 million in issuances. It is now $1.6 tr in issuances in just the last year. So four trillion issuances over time. In, in how many years? Uh, just in about 10 years. Wow. So, so this, yeah, is, so this, is, this is very so big business. So you get 2.7 trillion on the equity side, 1.6 trillion on the debt side. That's this a lot of money. Yeah, that's it's a lot huge. of money. So uh, obviously then, you know, when you have that much money, yeah. it's going to attract 
the attention of a lot of different a, a lot groups. of a lot of scrutiny a lot of skepticism yeah, yeah. so there's been you know some negative press yeah. recently describe what's going on there you know um there's a lot of things um that are happening so uh, people are have been attacking uh, esg investing in that it's a bubble and that uh, the price to earnings ratio is higher than it is generally. Um, they've been attacked as not living up to their promise in terms of financial performance. And it is true that earlier this year, um, ESG funds have underperformed the broader market. They've also been attacked for not achieving their goals when it comes to environmental and social impact. Um, some have criticized the funds for having uh, their companies having worse environmental and labor records, actually, than others. So, um, you know, and frankly, there's the, even the broader issue, even for those who aren't direct critics of ESG funds or skeptics, there is the broader issue of just nomenclature because it doesn't take much to call yourself an ESG fund. Yeah, these and you, days. you've you've got you know that that's rubbed you the wrong way. Even though Absolutely. you're an ESG effort and you run the yeah. ESG center, the fact that they're using that term bothers you. Why? Yeah, it does. Well, I, I actually think there are a couple issues. Is um, part of it is the challenge of lumping ES and G all together as if they're the same, right? So governance is really about the conduct of a company. Environmental and social issues are both uh, how the company conducts itself and its impact. And f funds aren't always clear about whether they're talking about conduct or they're talking about the impact side. The other thing is that if you're talking about an actively managed fund, I don't know who in the world would have an actively managed fund that doesn't take the G, the governance, into consideration. So I actually think that just even the conceptually lumping ES G all together when you've got particularly talking about actively managed funds, I'm not sure it makes sense. You know, it's interesting because the ESG activists, th this isn't true, you know, for 100% yeah. of it, but generally the ESG activists criticized companies because they were too focused on shareholder value right. and not focused enough on environmental and social issues. Right. And the fact that now the ESG funds are getting hammered because of lack of shareholder value right. creation there's, there's some irony in there that. Is indeed some, there is indeed some irony, but you know, the promise of ESG, the whole notion behind it was that if you uh, perform better in those areas, you will have better financial performance over time as, as well. And look, and I understand that particularly um, for the passive investors who are, you know, who are broadly invested in a market, they care about systemic risk. And so I understand the notion here is take governance, take environmental, take social impacts into consideration, and over time, you should be lowering the systemic risk to society that comes uh, from those areas. And, but this goes to what you've written about and what we've talked about, which is it's not either E. It's, right. it's not just, you know, be good to the environment or be good socially right. or have a good governance or produce share. It's all the above because yeah. it's a multi-stakeholder world and yeah. companies need to take care of their customers, their right. employees, their owners, the environment, and society, and they need to do it in a balance. Well, so that raises another issue with ESG funds um, and a criticism, which is, shouldn't everyone be taking ESG into consideration? And if the bulk of companies are, in fact, taking ESG into consideration, what is the separate value of having particular ESG funds, right? I mean, and that's, that's, you know, that goes to the whole definition question here, too. Well, there's also been discussion, of, you know, going back to the sin, you know, back to the six, yeah. back to the sin kind yeah. of, uh, you know, <laughs> let's just take smoking, for right. example. Um, and a lot of people said, hey, look, you know, if smoking is legal. Either right. make it illegal or make it legal. But if you're going to make it legal, then let's not attack those companies that are doing it because it's right. legal and they're they're doing everything with. So how do you? So that well, you it's it's look. There are that, that's another source of criticism of of funds and and um, you know whom they include and whom they exclude. So there are folks who um, have legitimately criticized um, uh, you know. Uh, the negative screen funds for excluding companies like Philip Morris International. Now, Philip Morris International is making a major effort to shift from um, smoke tobacco to smokeless um, cigarettes, right? And they're trying to 
that, that, that's sort of their purpose, their reason why they exist. And so if that's what they're trying to do, you know, should they qualify as CSG? Maybe, right? Um, likewise, um, you know, some uh, funds have been criticized for including, in Europe, including nuclear power because of its perceived legacy. But Except actually, it's carbon free. It's carbon free. So that's, you know, that there's a lot of criticism that comes with who's included, who's excluded from these Well, funds. and this, you know, we're in an energy crisis yeah. now and a shortage worldwide. Right. Yeah. And you've got funds that have attacked the oil companies. Yes. And you have banks and, and right. you know, a, a lot of social activists that have tried to stop all funding of any expansion of the oil industry. Now we have a shortage. Right. There hasn't been a refinery built since the, I think, the 70s yeah. in this country. And now the government is saying produce more. And the oil companies are saying, but you've been telling us not to produce. So, yeah. you know, this, there, there are some complex factors. There are complex, this. but I will say one thing that's happened in this proxy season on shareholder proposals. The shareholder proposals that were more extreme, that basically wanted um, companies not to finance any efforts to uh, develop fossil fuels, the mainstream investors like BlackRock and others have not supported those more extreme proposals because they recognize, especially today in our current environment, you know, you can't take fossil fuels off the, you off can't the, shut them off you until you have a, a solution. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, you know, it's interesting. Tesla has been held up as a darling for a long time as a carbon-free solution to, you know, personal transportation, da-da-da-da-da. And yet S&P just threw Tesla out of their ESG index. What's that about? Yeah, well, that's because, um, you know, I, this is based on public reports, so I don't know exactly what was behind S&P's thinking, but what they've said is that um, while Tesla's business is aimed at obviously, you know, carbon-free uh, automobiles, um, that their own conduct uh, at their plants, they were violating the Clean Air Act, or at least they had uh, issues with the EPA on it, and that their own labor practices weren't good. So this goes to the conduct versus impact side. So they were, they were tossed out because of their own conduct, even though, arguably, they've got some of the best impact and, out and there. And it was said that they didn't have a carbon strategy. Right, right. And it was so, their own so it was carbon. About, it, about how they were doing their manufacturing. Exactly. They their own, carbon right, strategy. exactly. That was the carbon strategy that was missing. Yeah, a complex issue. No, it indeed. is complex. And it does show why this ESG label is very complicated. And you've got to be really clear about whether you're judging companies on their conduct, on their impact, or both. Yeah. Now, the SEC is jumping in, yes. of course. You can't get trillions and trillions of dollars involved without the, you know, some sort of scrutiny here. But they're asking for more disclosure. Talk about what kind, what are they seeking? What are they trying to fix? Yeah, so they, in, in May, they proposed two, two new rules. Um, one would increase um, uh, the disclosure that funds need to provide uh, about their uh, about their ESG strategies. So they've got three tiers. They have um, integration funds where c funds uh, consider ESG factors sort of alongside others. They have ESG focused funds where ESG is more central to the decision making process. And then they have what they call what we've called impact funds. Those that are, are focused on uh, a achieving societal and environmental goods. Um, and the degree of disclosure that's required is much greater as you go down the list. So impact funds actually have to report on the progress they're making on, on environmental and social impacts. At the same time, they've updated the rules on the naming of funds. So if you're one of these funds that just kind of lightly considers ESG, you cannot call yourself an ESG fund or you get in real trouble. Um, what this reflects, Europe has done somewhat the same thing. What this reflects is the fact that ESG regulation is not just focused at companies, like the SEC rules on increased climate disclosure, you know, focused on corporations. It's also focused on the investor side. This is different from the past. This new era of ESG regulation is targeting not just companies, it's targeting investors. Well, and that's the purpose of the SEC is yes. to, essentially to, yeah. to create a level playing ground and you know provide yeah. 
the boundaries to protect investors. And so what they're trying to do here is they're just trying to say, hey, let's just let's yeah. make sure ESG means ESG. E right. So if people put their money there, expecting it, that it's not something else. Exactly. And they're bringing in some greater clarity. And, and you know, I think it's helpful in, in avoiding the issue of greenwashing, right, which is the notion uh, you know, companies are accused of it when they sort of overstate what they're doing for the environment. You know, this is to avoid it on the investor side. You know, just don't, you know, paint your prospectus uh, in the color green and call it ESG when you don't really take it seriously. Yeah. We're talking with Paul Washington about ESG funds and ESG broadly. What are the purpose of these funds? And next we'll talk about how asset managers view them and a little bit more about the criticism. I'm going to take a short break. We'll be right back. As you and your company monitor the latest wave of shocks that have battered the U.S. economy, the award-winning forecast team at the Conference Board now predicts a U.S. recession by the end of 2022. This recession will further compound the crises that have recently upended expectations, from a deadly pandemic to a war in Ukraine and the highest inflation rate in decades. Yet, unprecedented crises also present unforeseen opportunities if you have a trusted, proven navigator by your side. With that in mind, the Conference Board continues its long-standing tradition of providing timely and relevant content on a daily basis to help guide the business community through the economic storm. These trusted insights are being gathered on our website and are available to help your company master the challenges ahead. Chart a course for the future, which will allow your business to emerge stronger on the other side by visiting our free economic hub entitled Navigating the Economic Storm, Your Indispensable Guide Through the Global Recession located at www.conference-board.org slash topics slash recession. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board, and I'm joined today by Paul Washington, the Executive Director of the ESG Center here at the Conference Board, and an expert in all things <laughs> uh, ESG. So, you know, asset managers have been some of the biggest cheerleaders for sustainable investing, not to the detriment necessarily, as we said before, mm -hmm. of, over shareholder return, but, but you know, can right. we just have it all? Can we have great returns and so forth? But do they have a, an ulterior motive in addition to that? I mean, are they making more money on these funds? Well, that is one of the criticisms, is that the, the fees for ESG funds, including the passive funds, are higher than they are for usual index funds. Um, and so that, that is a source of criticism. I, you know, I would say that overall, um, I don't think anyone likes the fees they pay for asset managers, um, but there, there is a legitimate issue there. Um, you know, I think the way that should be resolved over time is by increased disclosure about what the uh, uh, the funds are actually doing to screen for ESG and um, and competition. But you know, the, in in the defense yeah. of of the funds, um, you know, a straight index fund is following somebody else's composition, and Correct. it's just all yeah, it's all automatically traded and uh, and so forth. So it doesn't require a lot of human interaction. In this case, you have to put either a negative screen or a positive screen. Yeah. you have to. You have to manage it. There is this. more work. No, there is more work. And I think the criticism um, has, has more force when it comes to the, to the passive uh, funds because especially if it's a passive fund that is simply applying, um, you know, some sort of kind of check the box approach, it, checking the box is, doesn't require as much, much work. On the actively managed side, you're right. It definitely does require, require, does require more work. But then... With higher fees, you know, tracking against any index, it it's difficult to beat yeah. the index. You know, we've That's right. we've seen this, you know, over a very long period of time, and you know, yeah. John Bogle's been a, a you know a a big uh, discussant of this for decades. But are these funds returning? Well, it's interesting. It always depends on you know what population of funds you're looking at and and the time period so I think it was pretty universally recognized that during the first year of the pandemic in 2020 ESG funds did outperform the broader market that has not been the case recently and um, and so you know depending on and there have been studies about this and I, you know, I think they're sort of unassailable. Depending on the time frame you're looking at, sometimes they've been 
outperforming. More recently, they, they, they certainly haven't, certainly not in 2020. But this goes back to something you said in, in the first part of our conversation, which is these funds are designed to be outperformers over the long run. That's exactly right. And that's why you know, I think we have to take all of this, you know, the positive news coming out of 2020, the negative news coming out of 2022, uh, you know, I don't know if it's a grain of salt, because um, I'm not sure that's a good sustainable diet thing. But anyway, but you, you really have to put them in the context of a of the longer term, because that's what these funds are about. Longer term returns uh, for investors and longer term returns um, for society. You know, Larry Fink has really been, uh, who's the CEO of BlackRock. BlackRock is one of the largest asset managers in the world with $10 trillion uh, under management. You know, he's been an... Uh, a proponent of ESG, but he, he recently wrote a letter to CEOs saying, quote, we focus on sustainability not because we're environmentalists, but because we are capitalists. Mm-hmm. So why did Larry Fink, the guy who has been, you know, really a champion for all things ESG balance, yada, 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 why did he feel he needed to come out and say something like that? There has been a fair amount of backlash against ESG. Um, people have um, said that you know companies are using ESG um, to, to they focus on ESG when they're not doing well financially, and they sort of draw attention to oh yeah, but we're doing all this stuff that's nice for the environment and so forth. Um, and there's also been the the criticism that you know th- that ESG you know it's been politicized, right, and that there's got this sort of progressive bent to it. And so I think those. Those types of backlash that it forgives under financial performance and that it's really taking a kind of political stance um, put BlackRock and others in the position of saying, no, we're actually doing this for very legitimate um, business purposes. And that capitalism itself, it depends, as you pointed out earlier, on a broader awareness of the welfare of stakeholders, a broader awareness of the welfare of society and the environment. Well, and, and of course, BlackRock it has one of the largest index funds yes. and ETF yep. uh, businesses, which, and so their approach in that sector of their business, they have other businesses, yeah. but in that sector has been more of the negative approach. Take an index, an S&P, knock out the yeah. worst performers and call it an ESG. And that's, that's caused some criticism too, mm-hmm. and there has been some underperformance. So. It is interesting that, I, you know, I think what I read in this, you know, from Larry is that he's coming back and saying it's all the above. It's it's the multi-stakeholder yeah. world and we're not excluding shareholder value from right. the equation, essentially. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. we're not sacrificing returns. Um, but, you know, this is any time. It's natural. There's this rush of money into ESG funds. A lot of people are talking about it. Um, there will be some natural backlash, and I understand it. There's a, there's a quote from a fellow named Eric Heller who says, every great cause begins as a movement, becomes a business, and degenerates into a racket. And I think all three are true of ESG. It, it is still a movement. It is a legitimate business, you know, investing in sustainable uh, agriculture and so forth. That's all really good, but around the fringes, there are people who are just kind of, there's a there's a little bit of uh, gaming. Gaming of the system. Yeah, yeah, and and this is the pendulum too. Yeah, so, and then it then it gets a you know inspires regulation. Yes, that gets you know, and so then it normalizes. Right, and that's you know it's right. probably it, not different it, than any it, new it, industry. It, it, that's exactly right. This is a natural evolution. I mean, it's just taking place at a time um, where there's real urgency around these 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 issues. Right. Yeah, it's uh, it you know it's interesting, and there's some other. Um, some other criticisms coming from academia. Yes. University of Colorado professor Sanjay Bagat writes in the Harvard Business Review that you know four four criticisms. One is that ESG funds have underperformed. Second, companies that tout their ESG cr- credentials sometimes have worse compliance for things like labor and environmentals. Mm-hmm. ESG scores of companies that signed the UN principles of investment didn't necessarily do anything after they signed, and companies that publicly embrace ESG. Um, sometimes are covering for poor performance. In other words, you know, he's, he again is saying, well, you got to have it all here. That doesn't sound like a ringing agreement, but you, you've talked about some of these criticisms, but, you know, is this again a description of, you know, the extent of the, of the pendulum swing? And, you, know, you know, we've seen this for 
decades when it comes to governance practices, right? Before it was ESG, there was a lot of focus on G. And you could have almost, you know, there are conflicting studies on whether a particular governance practice separating the chair CEO positions or poison pills or whatever, whether they helped shareholder returns over time or they hurt them. And so there's been a battle. And whether there's causality. Exactly. So there's been this battle of studies over time. Um, you know, I'm not going to quarrel with his particular findings, but there are always contrary findings here. And so I think one thing that, you know, we found in the governance world, at least, is that you, it, these empirical broad studies are fine. You really need to look at all of them collectively to sort of see what the, the world might be. But then that's at the macro level. But then so much of this happens at the micro level, right? I mean, you know, you know that what happens in a boardroom, Steve, um, is really uh, quite apart from any of the mechanical processes or policies the company ha has in governance. What happens in the boardroom makes a huge difference in corporate performance. So there's the you know the individual side. There's the company by company side of how they approach governance or how they approach ESG more broadly that has a really powerful impact that will never ever be captured by these broader empirical studies. Yeah, and you know, you and I have spent time in boardrooms yeah. and you know, very big companies. We know how complex these companies yeah. are. They're multinational global companies dealing with multi-business models and functions. And so, you know, it's hard to be perfect in every way, in every corner yeah. of the world, in every corner of the business. But it kind of takes me back to where are we going with this? You know, what's the end goal? And yeah. sort of this you know, I, I th to me, it feels like we have a new vision for what civil society should look like mm -hmm. in the future, and we're trying to incrementalize our way there. But it just seems like we should first start and talk about and get some agreement on right. where are we going. You know, what are the goals? Because who wants to live with dirty, you know, dirty air and right. and you right. know, unclean water? Uh, you know. Nobody. So all of these things, the objectives are great, but it's it's always how do you get there? Right. And I think having this goes for the ESG funds in particular, what would be very helpful is for them to be clear about their objectives, um, to provide clear information about their absolute and relative performance, um, financial performance, and and about their impact that they're actually having. Because I think we all do want, I mean, I don't care if you're from a red state or a blue state or whatever, we want a world where um, you know, it's a healthy, sustainable environment. Everyone wants that with the planet. And a we, fair and, and a fair, a fair, and, just a, and, fair and just, you know, society, a society and, and a, a society that's inclusive, you know, and provides opportunity things. for all. Like those are those are goals that I think everyone can get behind. Yeah. And, and and you know, so that's, let's just say, I don't know, wh what date are we going to hit it? Yeah. You know, whatever. <laughs> but whatever that date is, you know, it's, yeah. it's not today, it's not tomorrow, it's a couple, right. just it's, you know, it's a couple decades from now. There's a transition here, and there's a transition whether it's on the E side or the S side or the right. G side. And we have to reward the companies and the industries that are moving towards that. And I think this is part of where the criticism comes in with all of this because what they're trying to do is they're trying to say, look, natural gas is better than coal, right? right. It's cleaner than coal. Right. So let's reward the transition to natural gas. And then some people say, I'm using this as a yeah. metaphor. Some people say, well, that's still carbon. So that, you know, that's bad. It's got to be all wind or renewables. That's the, kind of the same thing in the SG. You know, we, right. you, you, you know, people want it to be all the way to bright and you know, it's a transition. It's one of the troubles actually with um, just having negative screens, yeah. frankly, because you know each industry. If you want everyone to be part of this transition, um, should you be withdrawing capital from those companies that may have farther to go? But if they're making progress, that's important, right? Well, and they need the capital. They need the capital. They need the support to make to do that the transition. Exactly right? right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a Paul. Great discussion. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. It's a lot of fun. And thanks to all of you for listening in to CEO Perspectives. Every week I'll be joined by an expert in their field and we'll talk about trusted insights for what's ahead. We'll talk about subjects in public policy, ESG, in terms of geopolitics, marketing and communications, human capital, and more.
I'm Steve Odland, and this podcast and webcast have been brought to you by the Conference Board.